Well, welcome everyone to our second Summer Sizzlers. I'm David Preziosi, Director of uh, Preservation Dallas, and we're excited that y'all could join us tonight for our second in our series of, of seven. And I'd like to uh, introduce I Irene Allender, who's our, our Membership and Programs uh, person, who uh, put together the series for us. Uh, and she's going to go ahead and uh, introduce our speaker for tonight. All right. Welcome everybody. We're glad to have you guys here. Um, so I am so glad that you guys could come and be part of this seminar with us. Uh, don't forget to, if you haven't already, to sign up for next week. We're going to be talking, uh, the lecture will be Sandoval, um, Sandro Canavas, and he's going to be talking about defending the adobes. And it should be a really great talk. I've heard Several people have been to his talk before and they've really enjoyed it. So we look forward to seeing you guys next Tuesday, same time, same place. Um, so tonight we have Kate Holliday. She's an architectural historian and professor at the University of Texas at Arlington and a founding director of the David Dillon Center for Texas Architecture. She's the author of many several of, of several books and essays. And most recently she edited the collection, The Open-Ended City, David Dillon on Texas Architecture. She is at work on the new book, Telephone City, Architecture and the Rise and Fall of the Bell Monopoly, the subject of her talk. She's also an advocate for historic preservation in Texas. She has served on the State Board of Review for the Texas Historical Commission for six years and is on the Board of Directors for Historic Fort Worth and works with community organizations to, or, to advocate for the protection of Freedman towns and their resources in Dallas and Fort Worth. And so I welcome Kate. Great, thanks so much for having me. Um, I, I know that uh, many of us probably have spent a lot of time in Zoom meetings recently, so I really applaud everyone for spending a little bit more time in a Zoom meeting with me. I promise to make this one as fun as possible. Um, and I really wanna um, second the endorsement for Sandra's talk next week on the Adobe's um, and Marfa architecture. He's really great after to speak in February and he, he will be really worth um, coming back for another Zoom meeting. Um, what I wanna talk about tonight are telephone buildings. Um, as Irene mentioned, I'm working on a book on telephone buildings. And so this is a little bit of, of a preview. Um, and I'm especially happy to do this in uh, Dallas because, of course, AT&T is here. And if, if we were in a room together, which I would really prefer, um, I would definitely ask you to raise your hands and let me know who actually had worked for AT&T um, or had a relative who worked for AT&T or someone who was a telephone operator in your family. And probably almost everyone would raise your hand. And I'm just going to say, if that's you, I would love to talk to you. Um, that uh, maybe not this week because classes are starting <laughs> up uh, in a couple of days here, but my email address is at the bottom of the screen right now. And I would love to talk to anyone um, who has experience working in telephone buildings with a telephone company, just so you can tell me what it's like to work inside the buildings. Because of course I've, I've never done that. I'm studying from the outside. Um, so I'll, I'll leave my um, email address on the screen there a little bit longer, just so in case you really uh, are gonna take me up on that, I'll leave it there. Um, and I'll go back to the, the title, The Ugliest Building in Town. Um, and this really is because um, if you start looking around across the country at telephone buildings um, and how they're described and how they're covered in almost every city in the United States, if you look at a list of buildings that people would really like to get rid of or that they really hate, the telephone building is on the list in every single city. Um, and I'll just give you a sampling of that here um, this, this image at, at the top left with, with this really wonderful BARF label is from a website um, that was talking about a heinously ugly building um, in the New York skyline. Um, over there uh, in the center, this idea of the fugliest building in Dallas um, is a Dallas Observer piece from a few years back about that uh, building on Bryan Street in East Dallas. Um, at the bottom left of your screen here, um, this is a telephone building in Houston. Um, that is in an article called Architecture Gone Awry, um, Houston's Eight Ugliest Buildings. Um, and then over there on the bottom right, um, this is uh, a Bell of Pennsylvania telephone building uh, right in the middle of uh, the center of Philadelphia. Um, that's in a, an article um, from Curved called The Ugliest Buildings in Philadelphia. Um, a few years back, there was a poll in Fort Worth, um, which buildings you want to see torn down. Uh, and number one, like by runaway number one, 
uh, was the telephone building in downtown Fort Worth. Um, just to kind of bring this home, uh, another example, this is a, actually a really great building in New York. This is an AT&T Long Lines building by the architect John Carl Warnicke, um, who also worked with Jackie Kennedy uh, to do historic preservation in Washington, DC. Uh, but in this case, he was a master of brutalist architecture um, uh, that was featured in an article called Eyesores of New York. Um, this, you know, I think this one in particular is actually a pretty amazing, wonderful building. And Warnicke talked about its monumental grandeur and mystery. Uh, and that idea that when you looked at a telephone building, in a lot of ways, you just don't know what's going on inside. Um, and if you talk to people about these big windowless hulking buildings, the question that most people have is what is that for? What is in there? Who is in there? Why is it there? Um, and this sense of mystery is very much a part of um, how these buildings really exist in the urban landscape today. The main thing about these really ugly buildings though, um, is that they weren't always that way. Um, telephone buildings have not always been the ugliest building in town. Uh, and I wanna flip through a couple of examples here to show you really the history of telephone buildings. Um, and what I'd like to do is, is give you a little bit of a glimpse into their history um, and then kind of end up answering the question, well, why, how do we get here, right? How do they end up being the ugliest building in town when they used to look like this? Um, this is one of my favorite buildings um, in the world. This is the New York Telephone headquarters or the Barclay VC building, um, now Verizon headquarters. Um, and also uh, it is uh, now luxury condominiums um, in New York City as well. It's by the architect Ralph Walker, who I wrote my second book on. Um, it was finished in 1926. Um, it's a gorgeous, beautiful building um, that uh, has a pretty incredible history of its own. I'll show you another telephone building. Um, this is the Pacific Bell headquarters in San Francisco. It's built at exactly the same time um, as the New York Telephone Company building. Um, it's by architects Miller and Pfluger. Um, I think this cover of the Pacific Telephone Magazine kind of tells it all in this kind of proud, soaring, beautiful building. Um, in this case, it's got some incredible architectural terracotta with those brave eagles along the skyline. Um, and these are buildings that are quite different than those windowless boxes that we looked at. Um, so, so let's go back and think about how, how we got um, from one step to the next. Um, we, we first get telephone service in the United States when Alexander Graham Bell patents telephone technology that allowed people to make uh, private calls, one-to-one. Uh, -one. Um, he wasn't the only person who was working on this, but he was the one who patented it. Uh, and that was the real key to this technology, not necessarily being the inventor, but having the kind of business acumen to patent this technology. Because what that meant was um, Bell um, licensed this technology to other companies all across the country and began to make lots and lots of money from that patent. What it meant to introduce telephone technology into cities was how do you begin to cram these point-to-point -point connections that are necessary to make a telephone call? Um, and we're all kind of used to the idea of a wireless phone, um, but even our wireless cellular phones today depend on actual physical connections between switching equipment. And so the first way that these wires and connections between one phone and another phone were made was by essentially popping a hole in the roof of a building, threading the wire from the phone up out the roof and onto these incredible scaffolds on the roofs, um, putting them along these incredibly tall um, telephone poles that carried uh, electricity, telegraph, and telephone all together, uh, and creating this whole other aerial city. And I'm showing you Boston and New York in 1880-ish um, um, as the way this, this technology development. This became a huge problem, <laughs> as you might imagine, because that's just the number of telephones that popped into cities within the first 10 years um, of the invention of uh, commercial telephone service. Uh, and this idea of the wire nuisance really leads to the first telephone buildings because people are afraid of the wires. Um, there is fear of um, them actually electrocuting you, which was more of a problem for electricity than for telephone lines, for sure. Um, and a cartoon like this one uh, with people walking around in rubber suits all the way down to the dog and the horse in a rubber suit to protect themselves. Um, if you look at newspaper 
articles from this time period, people are um, trying to find ways to get rid of all of this wire nuisance and this aerial mess in the city. <coughs> the way that this um, happens is that those wires are required to be buried. Um, and this is what leads to the very first telephone buildings. Um, in existing city streets, um, trenches are cut, conduits or pipe is placed underground and then threaded through these pipes, um, there are telephone lines. And the question then is not how to pop the line out the roof of the building, but how to bring it up through the basement. This led to this specialized telephone building, a creation that was specifically developed to allow the threading of telephone wires from the subterranean parts of the city and up into the building seamlessly, so you couldn't see it. Um, this was the first, one of the first two purpose-built telephone buildings in the country. It's by Cyrus Eidlitz. Uh, it's been demolished, uh, but it was completed in 1886. Um, and if you look at the um, elevation here on the right or the photograph, you know, it looks like a conventional office building from this time period. Um, maybe a tiny bit of Romanesque revival, some Gothic thrown in, um, maybe a little taller than the other commercial blocks next to it, but still a pretty typical office building. And you wouldn't necessarily know what was actually happening inside. The important thing about these telephone buildings was where they were located because the kind of wire that was connecting telephone to telephone was copper and copper then as it is now was expensive and so you needed to put these uh, buildings that had switching equipment inside of them close to your customers and so in the case of New York um, the telephone building was located about uh, two blocks right here in brown is the telephone building um, and over here is Newspaper Row, City Hall. Um, just to the south is uh, financial offices and Wall Street. This was a location that placed it as close as it could get to its major customers so it could save money on threading that copper wire through the city. And this continues to be a concern. Real estate prices and how close you could get um, were the part of the economic conversation about building a building. The technological part of the conversation about how to develop this kind of building was what do you put inside and, and where do you put it? Um, I'm showing you a photograph on the bottom of the basement, um, which included uh, dynamos or electricity generating equipment um, so that you could run the switchboards and power the telephone lines. Um, the spaces um, of the vault or the below ground spaces for threading cable um, through the basement and at, back out through the city into customers' buildings. Um, those wires would then run up from the basement and in these first buildings run all the way up to the top floors. And those top floors were where uh, the telephone operators were located. And probably a lot of you know the story that the first telephone operators were boys because they were really cheap. You didn't have to pay them much, but they were terrible telephone operators because it would hang up on people and they were rude and impatient. Uh, and so very quickly, women replaced boys as telephone operators because they were also inexpensive to pay, not as expensive as men, uh, but they were uh, polite and people wanted to talk to the telephone operator. And it was kind of, uh, there was a kind of national fascination with telephone operators and women's voices and these disembodied women's voices um, that became a part of the fascination with the telephone itself. And that, um, this idea of the telephone girl uh, was a huge part of the way that people began to think about um, interconnectivity and telecommunication in a way that's a whole other talk. Um, but I've got a few examples here of early telephone girls. Um, this is a, a musical um, with a cover depicting a very fashionable young telephone girl um, over in the 1920s. This is a long distance operator who's incredibly stylish uh, while seated at her desk. And the telephone girls were known within um, the telephone company um, kind of corporate speak as weavers of speech, right? The telephone operator seen here taking the wires from the telephone pole and connecting them to city, to country, um, and to suburb, right? Weaving the entire country together in this web of, of communication. On the other hand, telephone operators um, could be annoying, even as they were a, a symbol of this kind of sophistication and technology. And I wanted to share with you uh, one of the classic, um, let me move to a different screen here. Many of you probably remember Ernestine, 
from Laugh-In, um, and this is a really great Lily Tomlin uh, kind of satire on the telephone operator. And this one is really short, and I want to play it because it's a lot of fun. A great is good afternoon. This is your emergency operator speaking. How may I help you? You, you say what? You, you, ha you have a fire? Okay, well, I've lost my sound. A fire in your kitchen? But we can send you the link. Well, madam, the um, number... If you are wanting to, to hear her uh, pretty great routine there. Um, Lily Tomlin, basically, that was a 911 call where she um, advises the uh, woman on the phone who's reporting a fire to be sure to save the yellow pages from the fire, the most valuable thing in the house, and her princess telephone, of course. Kate, the, the sound came through. On so the that, that was the basic purpose of a telephone building. From that very first one, combining um, technology, wires, switchboards, um, telephone operators, um, as well as management, all into one building. Um, and by the end of the 1880s, you have a, a really clear uh, kind of typology that's developed. And I'm showing you telephone buildings um, that were built across the United States that all were kind of basically very similar to that one in New York. Um, from Chicago up here in the top left, here's New York again, um, St. Louis, this is um, Philadelphia, and then Boston uh, with the New England Telephone Company. So I want to show you a little bit of Dallas too, um, since we're here in Dallas. Um, Dallas, of course, is a little bit later than the big cities on the eastern seaboard. This idea that, that actually committing to a location and picking where that spot was going to be, right? Like in New York, it's right by City Hall and the financial district. Um, it took a lot of money to buy a piece of land that was next to all of those important um, sites. And so the telephone company had to have a lot of customers and be financially secure before they committed to a location. Um, and this sequence of images I'm going to show you now kind of makes that really clear. Um, this is the first... Um, kind of main switchboard in downtown Dallas. Um, it was on Ackard Street that's built in 1899. Um, it was for the Dallas Automat Automatic Telephone Company, which eventually became part of Southwestern Bell. Um, a few years later, they added two more floors on top, right? So the building stayed in the same location. They needed more space. They didn't move. They added two floors. And this is really common, right? So here's that nice pediment. Um, here it is again, uh, kind of stacking more floors on top. Uh, and just to give you a sense of what that was like inside, uh, this is the um, restroom for the operators uh, who needed a break occasionally from connecting all of their wires. Um, and this is 1930, that same building, um, after the telephone company has expanded, uh, built more space, uh, but that same building is still right where it used to be. And this is a part of that commitment to location. Right. Once the telephone company has a piece of land and a main switchboard in town, that thing almost always stays put uh, because of the subterranean connections and because you've got the vault that connects below ground and it's almost impossible, not, it's not impossible, but it's incredibly expensive to even contemplate moving all of that equipment so the building stays. This building is really great because as you can see from this photograph, it's sticking out into the streets. Um, and this was a problem for the city of Dallas. And they're like, what are we going to do with this? And so in this case, they decided to actually move the building backwards. Um, I'm going to share with you um, a one minute animation that I made of this moving process. I'm not a cinematographer, so it is not the best movie you will ever see. But it, it gives you a sense of what this moving process um, was about. Um, once they completed their new building um, in 1930, um, they took the old building that had been in this location since 1899 um, and without interrupting a single telephone call because the switchboard was still active, they moved the building backwards eight feet. And here's this little um, animation of, of still photographs that shows you how this happened over the course of one day. There you go. Right. The telephone company actually specialized in moving its own buildings in this way. This particular building stayed until 1961 uh, when it was demolished for an expansion. Um, and so the building on the left here was demolished in 1961 to make way for the building that still exists today. Um, that was completed in 1960-1961. 
Um, and of course, this building still remains in downtown Dallas as a part of the new complex uh, with Ed Whitaker Tower sitting on top of this building. And I'm just going to show you one construction photograph where this corner where that new video screen has gone in is this corner of this building. Um, and I go through this in a little bit of detail because that's one of the most important things about telephone buildings. It's a why they end up the way they do later is that what's really important about them is not necessarily the building, but the equipment that's inside them. Um, and there is this kind of cost conscious interplay between location, technology, and then the envelope that, that surrounds it. Another piece of this story that how we get um, from the beautiful telephone building um, to the ones that we have today um, really is about how quickly um, telephone service expands uh, and how much um, that means you have to build out more and more physical infrastructure. Because remember, for every telephone, you have to have a wire. Um, and so if you begin to expand uh, the number of people who have telephones, and there are two points that I would emphasize here. Um, at the beginning um, of this timeline in 1920, we have about 35% of households have a telephone. Um, in 1945, that number begins to go up incredibly fast, so that by 1970, like a generation after World War II, you have about um, 87, 88% of American households having a telephone. That is a massive expansion, and you have to build more and more and more telephone building space, more switchboards, hire more people, hire more operators to accommodate all of those um, new lines. At the same time, and I'll talk about this a little more later, there is automation that's happening in this process that also plays in to what happens with how the buildings look. Um, the popular fascination with the telephone um, it's never quite the same as it is with other forms of technology, but the telephone company very much tries to use its architecture for at least a couple of generations to really uh, become an important part of their marketing campaign. Um, there is a period in the 1920s when they're building buildings that they call urban giants. Um, and this is the Barclay BC building, that New York telephone building again. Um, and it should be obvious from this picture why they were called urban giants. They're huge. They're much bigger than anything around them. Um, and this is a part of why the telephone company tried to use the buildings themselves to market the technology, market the image. It was because they were inescapable. There were huge changes in the urban landscape that were brought by the telephone company. Um, and so they tried to create an image with these buildings that they called urban giants. Um, that would burnish their reputation and, and bring this idea of a kind of magical technology to bear, right? Slogans like, bring me a city, um, that were all about the idea of progress, um, tomorrow's telephones emphasizing the futuristic uh, aspects of the technology. All of this was a part of what played into these buildings like the New York Telephone Building. Um, and they went up all across the country from New York to San Francisco, as we already seen. And I want to show you a few more of these urban giants that um, pop up in the 1920s um, in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, with Iyer Timlin, uh, designed for the Southwestern Bell um, headquarters, this monument to communication. Um, the Southern Bell headquarters in Atlanta, 1928 to 1929. This one is really terrific. It's got these linesmen um, on the front of the building. They're holding wires that connect them to each other. Uh, you've got the Ohio Bell headquarters um, in Cleveland with this really incredible rendering on the right there that um, shows this uh, lighting pattern that um, is really fantastic. Love that one. Um, Northwestern Bell headquarters in Minneapolis, which ends up with a great microwave tower on top. The Mountain State Bell Telephone Building in Denver, 1929. I mean, you can see how much the National Bell Monopoly is building um, in the 1920s. This one has beautiful murals inside the lobby, and there's actually a telephone museum here in this building in Denver. Um, and then our building in Dallas by Lang and Mitchell. If, if Marcel Quimby is here, she can tell you more about this building probably than I can. Um, and then the Ohio Bell Building um, over there on the right in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and I'm just giving you a, a kind of sampling because there's a lot more to suggest how much the telephone company was a builder 
and I think this is something that people don't really realize is that if you um, have a telephone, there's a building that's connected to it somewhere. So just, I, I wanna walk you through um, a big telephone building as opposed to the small one we looked at before and see what's similar and what's different. Um, again, this is a Berkeley VC building. This is a pamphlet that was printed um, right when it opened, celebrating the creation of the largest telephone building in the world. Um, and it was some a, a kind of object of public fascination. Um, the construction of this building was chronicled by artists and photographers in New York. Um, and it was a kind of modern marvel and masterpiece. Um, it's actually the frontispiece to Le Corbusier's Towards a New Architecture, which is a little bit ironic because Walker and Le Corbusier hated each other, but, but it gives you a sense for how modern this building was conceived of at the time. Um, so I'm gonna walk you from uh, kind of bottom up <coughs> um, along the VC Street side, there is an arcade um, that connected this particular telephone building to the public Washington Market that was across the street. Uh, below ground, um, that's where all of those cable vaults were located um, and are still located actually um, in New York, as well as this really amazing um, cafeteria. Uh, so the employees would go down into the windowless basement to go to the cafeteria. You go up a little bit, moving into these middle floors between one and 10. Um, and that's where um, the wires were coming up from the vault and into the building. So before, when they were up at the top, once the buildings get really tall, it's cheaper to bring all of those um, switchboards down further into the building. So you use, use less copper wire. Um, and so this is a traffic room um, that you're seeing in the photograph. Um, the telephone operators and the switchboards were also in this uh, part of the building from floors one through 10. So the kind of technological part of the building is in the block at the bottom. As you moved up, um, you went through um, advertising and sales and accountants and all the white collar part of the telephone company. And then all the way up at the top, uh, right here in floors 30 and 31, um, these were corporate executives offices. And then all the way at the top at the penthouse, these, this was the auditorium um, where employee events were held um, up at the top. So a lot of consistency from those early 19th century buildings. Really the main thing that's different is how big they are. Um, the kind of equipment, because we're moving at this point to a combination of long distance switchboards, as well as some automated switching um, inside of, of the uh, buildings. Um, they come down in the building, but really everything else remains pretty similar. The other interesting thing about this period of telephone buildings and this idea of urban giants um, is that architects become very involved in trying to craft this public image uh, for the telephone company. Uh, and again, this is Ralph Walker. He was a member of a very large firm, McKinsey, Voorhees, and Mellon. And he was part of a generation of architects who worked with the telephone company to develop what they called the American perpendicular. Um, this was a style that they specifically developed for the telephone company um, that was supposed to express the modern American spirits. I think if you look back at that series of buildings that I showed you, you can see that the American perpendicular, we would call that Art Deco today, um, with its a pretty amazing combination of setback st skyscraper style um, and this incredible um, use of ornaments um, at these pivotal transitional moments in the building. Um, Walker had developed this kind of language for his architecture in a series of commissions in New York. Um, and at the telephone building, he really used images of the American landscape, both in its uh, flowers and vegetation, as well as its animals with this uh, mountain lion um, that has caught a cobra. Um, he used modern production methods. This is a piece of cast stone um, that is used to ornament the lintels. Um, along the base of the building. Um, and these buildings were uh, supposed to be a kind of uh, balance between an economical use of material so that the buildings are clad in brick, right, which is an inexpensive material, with just a few ornamental flourishes around doors, um, over lintels at the base, and then I'll go back a minute, and then up at the very top levels where there's this fantastic ornament um, in cast stone uh, with this elephant with his trunk Kind of draped down the, the corner of, of the building. So this American perpendicular um, had ornaments only at key moments 
but the rest of the building was pretty spare. Um, so the lobby at the Barclay VC building um, has this incredible um, set of uh, frescoes that tell the history of telecommunication from smoke signals to semaphores to beating drums to send sound across great distances. Um, and that really celebrated the presence of the telephone as a symbol of modern life um, in America. This is a really incredible um, image from, from those ceiling frescoes. But they were also places of work. Um, and this image of, of five o'clock in the Barclay VC building was a part of the um, telephone company's self-publication. Um, it was a magazine printed for its employees. Um, and it was a place for people to come work, for telephone engineers, traffic engineers, telephone operators and managers to populate the entire space of this building. None of these buildings that were part of this moment of American perpendicular would have happened without collaboration. Well, I've talked about the architects. There were sculptors, artists, um, telephone company engineers. None of them would happen without collaboration. Um, this is one of my favorite images of the New York skyline because there are three telephone buildings in it um, from our Long Lines building here um, to an earlier Long Lines building that was designed by um, Ralph Walker's firm to the Western Union headquarters. Um, and all of these buildings are connected to each other under the ground. Um, and so it's this kind of interesting inversion of, of um, how we see the city. <coughs> the Long Lines building, um, what I really want to emphasize here is the way that architectural delineators like Chester Price projected an image for the building. Um, in the Western Union building, the way that artists like Hildreth Meir, the uh, mosaicist, uh, was an essential uh, partner in creating the building through this incredible series of mosaics in the lobby. Um, here on the right, this is her continents linked by telephone and wireless. Um, and then up here along the ceiling, moving towards the elevator lobby, telephone wires and radio unite to make neighbors of nations. Um, part of this really optimistic moment when the idea that we would communicate with each other freely um, through these golden telephone wires would mean that we would usher in an era of modern understanding. And the last piece, the kind of lighting experts here. I love this drawing um, showing this stylish guy in his 1928 suit with this pretty incredible um, uh, design for chevron lining with this up lighting that shows you the ceiling here. And what I really want to point out about the Western Union building is it's almost entirely brick, right? So it, incredibly economical. And while we think of Art Deco as being really opulent, um, these buildings were very much on the cheap side of Art Deco because of the materials that were chosen for them. So then the question is, how do we get here? And this is the last little bit that I want to um, share with you is how did we get here um, to this complex um, on Bryan in East Dallas, um, where you've got um, a telephone company parking lot, um, you've got three buildings that are very loosely connected and that collide with each other. It's not very aesthetically appealing. Um, you've got a microwave tower over in the corner in another lot. How do we get from something that involves collaboration of artists and architects and engineers um, to, to what you see here? Um, and there are, there are a lot of factors. Um, a lot of it has to do with money. A lot of it has to do with labor. Um, and a lot of it has to do with changes in technology. Um, no one of those things is the only reason, but all of them together. So let's think about it a little bit. This is actually the telephone building that was originally on the location of this complex. Um, it was the Haskell Central Office Building. Um, it was built by the Dallas Automated, uh, Dallas Automatic Telephone Company, um, just like the one downtown originally was. Um, and it was a neighborhood telephone office. Um, no one telephone office could serve a city as, as um, uh, expansive as Dallas was. Um, and so these additional exchange offices were necessary. Um, Haskell didn't last too long um, as, you know, we have this acceleration of the number of lines. Um, and when it was expanded, that local exchange got the addition of a long distance exchange um, added to it. The long distance exchange um, meant that long distance operators were located there. So when you picked up your local phone and wanted to make a call, the operator would connect you to the long distance building. The long distance building by the 50s also got a microwave horn on top uh, because that was the future of long distance by the 1950s. 
Uh, and this is a, a view of what the inside of the Haskell building looked like in the 1950s. This was an unair conditioned space um, filled with electronic equipment. And by all accounts, this was extremely hot. You can see here the windows are open, but the blinds are pulled all the way down. There are fans up here that have been turned off for the photograph, but hopefully they turned them right back on again. Um, these were hot. They were often loud buildings also, depending on what kind of equipment you were working with. Um, and so turnover amongst operators was really high. Uh, it was a hard job um, in a pretty physically unpleasant environment. And I know that if I had to work with someone looking over my shoulder all day long, it would make me unbelievably nervous. My mother um, has shared with me that she was a telephone operator very briefly, but it just was so nerve wracking she couldn't hack it. So, uh, and I know many people um, felt, felt the same way. Um, this, led across the country, but I'm showing you an example from Dallas, um, to the idea that uh, the unionization of the labor associated with the telephone company, there were a number of labor disputes in the 50s and 60s, all, all the way into the 70s really, um, affirmative action disputes, uh, working condition disputes, pay disputes, um, gender equal opportunity disputes, right? Because all those photographs of women operators you know, uh, women didn't get to go into management and men didn't get to be operators. And so all of this kind of dissent uh, and need for change within the telephone company leads to a number of strikes and demonstrations. Um, this is a photograph from um, the 50s of a group of operators from the downtown uh, office out on the streets picketing, although it looks very pleasant <laughs> as, a, as a picket line. Um, what this meant from the telephone company's point of view was that labor costs were skyrocketing, right? Even though um, much of the process was being automated, there were still lots of operators. Um, there were still lots of people working directory assistance. There were still people helping make people make collect calls, right? There was still a huge workforce associated with the telephone company. And that expense, like the expense of buildings, really begins to weigh um, by the 1960s. So changes in technology also put pressure on buildings, right? You have labor costs, labor costs going up um, and technology changes um, from our original uh, manual switches to automatic switches and now to digital switches in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and this is an advertisement for an early digital switch um, in which there is like just kind of celebration of the idea that it's gonna be really quiet instead of loud and there's not going to be any people, right? So quiet, empty, um, less expensive to maintain. Um, and so that is part of what's going to happen with telephone buildings. This is a photograph of the interior of the Barclay VC building that was taken really recently um, that has some of their digital switching equipment. This is um, equipment that monitors network traffic and, and um, network traffic flow. Because what also happens with telephone buildings is that a lot of them now certainly service cellular networks, but a lot of them also uh, form the backbone of the internet. Um, and so all of those underground conduits have now simply been translated in many cases um, into spaces for fiber optic cable for internet traffic uh, to move through. And so this is that same telephone building from 1926, but it's now a data hub and a hub of a digital um, network. One more shot of that very, that quiet, cold, um, space, very different from the early um, telephone switching spaces. Um, the other thing that these, this new kind of equipment needs, um, it needs very um, kind of specialized type of structure to support it, but it also needs air conditioning. And that's one of the biggest reasons for the move to a windowless building. Um, each of these digital switches, and this is a page from the um, a uh, magazine for South Central Bell that talked about the idea that the heat from those digital switches was actually going to heat the entire building. But what that meant for a building someplace hot was that there was a need to cool it down. Um, and so a highly regulated temperature, a lot of clean air was necessary in these buildings. So sealing them off to the outside and creating this kind of in mechanized internal environment um, was part of the reason for the move to windowless. And so that's how you get here. Um, 
Labor costs mean you want fewer people working for you. A switch to a new kind of equipment means you have fewer people, although there were certainly people still in the building. And the need for a new kind of equipment means that there's more value placed on air conditioning in a sealed mechanized environment. Um, the costs for running um, this massive building program get incredibly high. And so there's not even any room anymore uh, for this kind of collaborative um, interaction with artists. Um, and I think actually the last thing, sometimes people feel like these are just brutalist buildings, um, but it, I think that's actually an afterthought. Um, for the most part, all those other factors play much more into the creation of something that looks like brutalism, but comes from someplace else. Um, these are really fascinating buildings. Um, and again, anyone, I, I haven't been in this particular complex, but I've been in a lot of telephone buildings. I've been certainly in the downtown Dallas, in Atlanta, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, there's a lot of telephone buildings, um, but I've never worked in one. And so if anyone has any experience that they'd like to share, please do get in touch with me. The last point that I wanna make really is, once you enter a phase where the telephone company, when the monopoly is busted in 1984, you know, and the idea of cost cutting becomes absolutely central to how um, telephone companies will survive going forward. Spaces like the one you see here um, this is the original lobby of that Eckerd Street telephone building. This becomes almost impossible to maintain, incredibly expensive to maintain, and certainly nothing like this, which is the elevator lobby of that building, would ever be designed, um, again, at this level of expense and craft, um, simply because it doesn't really match with the new emphasis on a kind of people-less, technologically driven um, image. Last point is um, if this was interesting and you want to read more, I did um, just um, through the Society of Architectural Historians, they have a, a new publication called the Archipedia. That's an online um, publication. And I do have an essay about telephone buildings on there that gives a little bit more detail about a few buildings across the country and some more context. So if you're interested, just let me know and I can send you the link.